they make sense as uh, we put the story together. Uh, whether the story's in the words or in these uh, equation forms that we're using here. And again, this can be a summation of any parts of the system that happen to be changing speeds. And remember the little warning that I gave you uh, on uh, Monday, even though somebody here will forget it, will take the bullet for the rest of the class and be the one person who doesn't remember the simple algebra of the uh, difference of two squares is not equal to the square of the difference. So somebody's going to make that mistake. I know it. It's happened every single year. So I'm just waiting, waiting to grade that first set of homework, see who does it. Uh, we uh, may or may not be changing the speed. It uh, depends, problem dependent. We'll look at it as we go. But if all of the work is not used for changing the speed in some way, we can also raise or lower a part of the system or the system as a whole. And that's uh, just the change in gravitational potential energy. And again, it depends on what pieces of the <coughs> are in the system and what height change they undergo. Remember, this has nothing to do with any sideways moment, movement. It's the movement parallel to, meaning other, only uh, in the vertical direction of uh, any of the masses in the system. So we might have several different masses moving up or down, and each of them may have their own, their own height changes in there. It doesn't matter. You can calculate them all separately, and then just add them up and put that term in as the uh, change in gravitational potential energy term. And we might have an elastic medium in this system or more. And again, it's nothing more than summing all of those little pieces up if we happen to have more than one. If we have two springs in the system and they have different spring constants, just calculate their change in potential energy separately and add them together. And it's dependent, of course, on the change in like how much energy, how much can, uh, potential energy is stored in the system at any one time. The nice, one of the nice parts about this right hand side is all of these are point functions. Remember what I mean when I call them that? Remember what I called that? Is define a point <clears throat> function on Monday? Not path dependent. Sorry? Not path dependent. Yeah, not path dependent. It only depends upon wherever the system finishes and wherever it starts and the difference in those two things. Whatever happens in between is immaterial. Sometimes you can use that to your advantage and very much simplify uh, a problem with that use. So these are all um, point functions on the right side. It's very much a path function on the left side as obvious by the fact that it's an integral and it depends upon the position of the object at one, any one instant. <coughs> so we have all those um, parts put together here. These two parts here also involve forces, but those are forces that we do not include over here because those are conservative forces. The easiest way to tell what we mean by that is to imagine looking, watching a, uh, any of these systems undergoing its motion and uh, we videotape it. If we run the videotape backwards, conservative forces are, it's always going to be obvious that the system's running backwards. You can tell from the film 
watching the film, either forwards or backwards, you can watch that and tell that it's running backwards. Uh, for example, if we've got some object that's being pushed along the floor, a little bit later, it'll be somewhat farther down the floor, and we might notice in the movie that the floor has been scratched because of friction. We might notice even uh, if in some way it's monitored that the system's a little bit warmer because of that friction. And if we watch that movie backwards, we would see an object here being pushed that way, but it would move back to its original position and would actually repair the surface of the floor over what you just slid. You watch that and you know that's not possible that there's no way that could have happened. That's the nature of non-conservative forces. If we had a, a rope in the, in the problem pulling, then when we run it backwards, we see the ropes pushing, and that's just, again, an impossibility. If we had a mass going up or down in the system, for example, we could have had a mass attached to this, uh, weight as it goes over there. If we run it backwards and look at just that, all we see is that there's a mass going up or down. Without knowing what's going on the rest of the system, we can't look at that one part of the system and tell if it's running backwards or not. There's certainly systems that could lift masses and there's certainly systems that could lower masses. We have to see the whole rest of the problem to know what it's going, whether it's uh, which way it happens to be running. But then we're looking at the non-conservative forces anyway. It doesn't make these non-conservative just because they're attached to non-conservative forces. When viewed all by themselves, we can't tell whether that uh, system's running frontwards or backwards. The same is true if we happen to have a spring in the system somehow. As the weight, uh, as the object moves, um, we could, uh, if we looked only at the spring, all we see is a spring that's increasing in length or decreasing in length. There's nothing inherent in that movement that indicates which way the system's running. We have to, again, look at some other part of the system to, to tell. We couldn't look at the spring alone and tell whether it's running backwards or not. That's the nature of conservative forces. They can go either way, that if system in terms of those forces, the system can return completely to its original state. Non-conservative forces, we can't get back to the original state by just simply running the system backwards. If you have to push the box across the floor to run it backwards, you've got to push it back to its starting point, and you're twice as tired, not, no, not tired at all as you were when you started the problem. So, uh, that's the pieces we're looking at, and remember this work is going to change each of these in the same direction as the sign on the work that's doing it. So we can use that to our advantage as we go through some of these problems. So, let me put up a more complicated problem. And since it is a little more complicated, I've already printed it out for you so you don't have to draw it. You can if you want. Chris, you can correct the drawing or improve it with some of your artistic touches. All right, what we have here is something like uh, perhaps a garage door opener of some kind. Maybe the garage door is attached to this bracket, and a motor pulls the bracket back as the garage door is open. There's a counterbalance attached to the system. Just to uh, allow us to use a much smaller motor, take some of the load off of the motor, that's the point of the counterbalance. Uh, the very same way it works on an elevator system. And there's a spring-loaded uh, attachment to it to allow the system to, to very easily return and drop the door 
back down to the bottom. So uh, something like that is what we've got. Uh, as we begin this problem, at point one, which is already moving with some velocity, what we want to do is design things such that it comes to a stop here at point two. We don't want it to keep going and smash into the, the structure of the garage, nor do we want it to stop short of that, and perhaps it's not open enough for the uh, driver to get into the garage. So um, with that, those values on the spring, and there's some dimensions of the general hookup where the spring is, we want to find an appropriate mass for the counterbalance such that we bring it to a stop at point two. If the mass is a little too heavy, it'll go too far. If it's too light, it won't go far enough. There's a certain point where the motor can no longer pull against the spring and the system will come to a rest. So that's the setup we've got. We start with the work energy equation and see if there's any parts of it with which we are already finished because of the path uh, or sorry the point function nature of some of these that uh, a lot of them could turn out to be zero right off the right off the front and we could be done with them have a smaller problem right from the start so is everybody comfortable with what the uh, setup is here I'll give you just a second to make sure you get the numbers down before we start. And then, of course, a second to put the uh, work energy equation on your paper because it's a great place to start. Yeah, man. Can you just read off the values and write up? Oh, okay. This is the rest length of the spring, 0.25 meters. The spring constant, 0.32 kilonewtons per meter. The uh, bracket is 14 kilograms. Its initial velocity to the right is 1.2 meters per second. The engine, the motor is pulling on the cable with a force of 60 newtons, assuming that's constant. We want to come to a stop at point two, so that's zero meters per second. And then, uh, I'm, I don't know if I mentioned that, there's a, a little bit of frictional drag as the counterbalance goes up and down its channel of about 180 newtons. So as the bracket goes to point two, the mass is going to drop, and as it drops, there's 180 newtons uh, of friction as it slides down the channel. Okay, Joe? Z1, is that going to the left? Is yeah, because it's going from point one to point two, so it's already going to the left. I'm uh, sorry, going to the right. Oh, okay. No, that's just a dimension arrow. Okay. Sorry, it's, it's going to the right with uh, a speed of 1.2 meters per second. So it's already on its way to close, and uh, we're just interested in getting the system right so that it comes to a stop at point two. All right, everybody comfortable? Okay, look at each one of these four pieces and decide if any of them are zero. If so, we're already doing a smaller problem. Are there any outside or non-conservative forces in the problem? If there are, this is not zero and we need to calculate those. Things like friction. Things like the motor being pulling like this. If we run things backwards, the motor's not going to push with 60 newtons. So uh, we can clearly tell that uh, that's a non-conservative force. So we have both the motor and friction that we need to account for in the uh, the non-conservative work term. Is anything changing speed? In fact, several things are changing speed. Two things of concern. The bracket is changing speed 
and the counterweight itself is also changing speed. So we're going to have to count, uh, look at both of those. I'll put CB down for counterbalance, that, that mass at point B. Is anything changing height in a gravitational field? Of course, the counterbalance is. Nothing else is, so that's the only term we're going to have in that one. And we have the spring on the system, and it is changing in length, so we're going to have to calculate that term. Okay, so none of them disappear. This is a, a, a pretty involved problem, and then we've got several items in each of the four major, major categories. So it's as easy as anything, I think, to go back and just look at these one by one. That way you're doing a small problem. You're not going to mess up the units. In fact, just to, uh, just to hopefully um, hopefully give you confidence that it works nicely to do it this way, this is just a quick peek at what the work energy equation would look like if you put all of the values in. <clears throat> if you put everything in with all of our unknowns and all the knowns, you get this nice equation at the top there. First thing you're going to do is leave off your units. So you're going to get down to this. It looks a little bit nicer, but don't forget you've got to solve this for the mass of that counterbalance B. And you've got to do all of that without messing up one minus sign, not messing up one squared term. I just don't think that that, that might be uh, a convenient way to start the problem. I don't think it's a convenient nor an efficient way to finish the problem. So my recommendation to you is to do these one at a time, one piece at a time. Then we're doing small problems with just a few minus signs, a few squares, and it's very, very hard to mess up any of those. It's harder. All right, we have work being done by two things in the problem. The motor, maybe if I put the M up here where the O was, and we have work being done by friction. Now we're taking those all to be constant, so the integral integrates nicely, it just becomes the force times the distance. So the work done by the motor is the 60 newton force it pulls for a distance of 0.4 meters. Does, uh, does the fact this is positive make sense? We need to check the minus signs every single step. Should this be positive? The force is to the right. The motion is to the right. It should be positive. It should be also Newton meters. Makes sense. Those are the units for work. Add to it the friction term. It's nice in that the friction is given. We don't have to actually find it. We know it to be 180 newtons. As the counterbalance drops, because the bracket goes from 1 to 2, how far does the counterbalance move? Because that's the distance over which the friction is doing work. <coughs> Sorry? Point four over 2. Yeah, because of the cabling, and if you do uh, what we did a couple, uh, I think last week when we were looking at constrained motion, you'll see that it will drop half of that distance. As the bracket moves 4.4 meters, the counterbalance will drop 0.2. Is that positive or negative? As the counterbalance slides down, friction force is going to be up in the opposite direction of the motion. So this is going to be negative. 
And that's all the parts we have doing non-conservative work. So we calculated them separately. We just simply add them up. <clears throat> What's that come out to be? A, a minus 12, I think. What's the minus sign mean here? This is the total work done, and we're left over the minus sign because the friction term was a little bit bigger. To the system as a whole, though, what does the minus sign mean? David? Energy is being removed from the system. Uh, work, positive work is the addition of energy to the system, negative work is the subtraction, so there's more energy coming out through the friction than is being put in by the, uh, by the motor. And this system we're talking about being, of course, the two masses. Alright, so there's, there's the first term. Now we can look at the kinetic energy term. There's two things. So we have uh, a change in speed of uh, the bracket I labeled A and the counterbalance I labeled B. And those can be calculated separately. There's no need to put them together. Look at each one separately. Make sure the units are right. Each one may have its own individual uh, velocities. So I put this A here to remind me that in the bracket I use the velocities of A because they're not necessarily going the same speed at any one time. If you'd rather put the subscripts inside on the Vs, feel free to. Uh, this just seems a little cleaner to me. Um, before we get going, are any of those terms zero? If any are zero, we're done with them, we're doing a smaller <coughs> problem. Bill says no, David, you says yes. What? I thought you meant as a whole. No, we, we're, we're just looking now if any of the little parts can drop out. Yeah. Uh, if the velocities hadn't changed, or if they changed but returned to their original value, we would have been done with that back here. Just no reason to write it out any farther if we don't need to. All we're looking for is, is there any velocity change? If there is, then we go down to this step and see if any of those velocities are zero. Are any of them? Remember, we're trying to bring the system to a stop, so V2 is zero when the bracket comes to a stop. The counterbalance will also come to a stop when the bracket comes to a stop. I think it's important if you do each term individually this way. If you don't, you're very likely to lose these minus signs here. And I say that from the experience of having seen students do that hundreds of times over the years. So the mass of A, 14 kilograms, its velocity is 1.2 meters. Don't forget there's a minus sign in front of that. Uh, is that going to give us proper units. We have Newton meters over here, so I want every other term to also be Newton meters. Kilogram meters per second squared and another meter, we have Newton meters. So the units are okay there. Uh, this will be a negative term. Does that make sense? That means it's Losing kinetic energy. Is bracket A losing kinetic energy? 
Of course it is. First it's moving, and then it's not. Note also, though, remember Joey's question was what was the direction V1 was moving first? For the kinetic energy term, that wouldn't make any difference. Since we square the velocity, we don't care which way it's going, we just care if it's going. And the second term, this MB is the whole, the big unknown for the problem, so we've got to leave that in there as a variable. But we do know the velocity. What's the initial velocity when uh, we start the problem? What's the velocity of the counterbalance? This is moving half as fast as A is. Moving half as far, we already got that. If it moves half as far in the same time, it's moving half as fast. So its velocity is 0.6. Now, if the mass is in kilograms, our units are going to be fine. So this. Uh, this term happens to reduce to uh, something a little bit easier, I believe. Minus 10.1, minus 0.18. Double check this. I think that's right. And this is all in units of newton meters. We checked that at each point, and we know that MB must be in kilograms for the units to work. What's nice is if I do this, I can leave out the units because I've double checked them. Now I'm down to just a very simple term with our unknown in it as a single variable. Did that? Did that double check out these these two coefficients? Double check. Okay, great. All right. So uh, second term, we have the counterbalance drops a little bit. Nothing else is changing in height, so we don't need to concern ourselves with it. Um, so it's m b g. Delta H B. But we know parts of that. Remember, this MB is still unknown, so we have to leave it like that. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Is this minus? That's the, the obvious I use the SI value for G, but should that be minus 9.81 meters per second squared? I got a no, I got a no. Everybody else is ignoring another no back. No, it shouldn't. <coughs> In uh, these classes, we treat this essentially as a constant. And it's, excuse me, a non-negative constant. The fact that the block is moving down, we take care of with the delta H. And it moves down a distance of 0.2 meters, but that's minus 0.2 meters because it drops. Um, that accounts for the fact that there'll be a decrease in the potential gravitational potential energy. So we get what? A minus 1.96 MB. Is that right? Now, again, I know MB, the mass of the counterbalance, must be in kilograms for these units to work. I know it must be a minus because it's the only thing I have moving vertically and it goes to a lower height, so it decreases. It loses some gravitational potential energy. 
So I'm down to a couple very simple terms. It's getting to be a, a real simple problem that we'll be able to put back together shortly. So let's do the last term. What I'll do is I'll move my work term over here just because I will need it. Is that what it was? Yeah, it's minus 12 newton meters. Okay. For the potential energy of the spring, we only have one spring in the problem, so we only have to worry about that one. But I do have a couple little pieces I need to figure out. K is given. It's in kilonewtons per meter. I'm going to want to make that newtons per meter because everything else is just in newtons. But I've got that term. We're okay. Uh, I do need, though, to figure out what del 1 and del 2 are. Do you remember how those are defined? Your book doesn't do this. I think this is a much simpler way to do it. The book, I think, uses an X in here. It defines it in the same way, but uses an X in here, which I find problematic because that looks like it'd be the same X that this is moving and it's going to cause trouble. So this, this means it's particular to the spring itself, no reference to X or Y or any other part of the problem. Remember how we define del? David? That should be the difference between the difference from the point of rest from the spring. Okay. So the the <coughs> working length, if you will, at whatever particular point, minus the rest length of the spring. That will uh, tell us how much, because it, it's when a spring is either stretched or compressed that it stores potential energy. So we need to know what those are. Um, L1, well, these are two, uh, two um, right triangles we have going here. The first one, when it's at point one, it's uh, the triangle shown there of 0.3 meters by 0.2 meters. And L1, don't worry about the fact there's a, a lead to the spring. You know, like just take it as, uh, as this, the simple distance that it is. You can make these too hard if you want. And L1 comes out then to be, looks like it's going to be somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4 maybe. Bill, do you have it? Point, point point three six. Point 0.36. I think I have 0.361 as a matter of fact. And L0 is the rest length of the spring that was given. That's the spring, you take the spring out of the box, lay it on the table, and that's how long it is. So. That term is, so del 1 is 0.361 minus 0.25. Um, we don't need to worry as much about minus signs because this term's going to square anyway. But uh, don't get in the habit of getting sloppy with minus signs. Point uh, 1, 1, 1, right? And so we'll square that and put it in there. Del 2 we find in the same way, just now we have a slightly different triangle because now the spring is quite stretched out. Now it's going to be anchored from 0.3 all the way out to 0.7 total. So that's across the top. The vertical distance is still the same. So that gives us L2. And what is that term? Point seven two eight. So that's L two. We subtract from that. Point two five. Oops, I forgot the units in there. And so that equals uh, point four eight.
and now we have our potential energy term. Is this going to be positive or negative? Or can you tell? It's not always easy to tell on a spring. It sort of depends on uh, just where it starts and where it finishes. So would you expect this, this in this problem for it to be positive or negative? This kinetic energy, or sorry, potential energy term. Positive. Positive. It, it's the, the spring is relatively relaxed. It gets stretched a great deal, so it's got a lot more potential energy stored in it. Remember, we've got to make the K term good for newtons rather than kilonewtons so that our units will work. And we can just uh, fill in terms. Oops, I've switched del 1 and del 2 here. But the minus sign would have told us that. And we get, again, it's positive like we expect. What's that come out to be? Everything into the full equation and do it from there? Okay. 
okay, he better be right, or he's going to suffer our abuse. So, sorry, Phil, you said you had it? Tommy, you got it? Uh, I got 10.78 kilograms. Maybe it's not that easy to solve this. Did I write, I wrote it down right, didn't I? Minus there, those are two minuses, that was minus, that was plus. David, what do you have? How about 17, how about 17 kilograms? How many, like 17 kilograms? Chris is just going to say that's what he got no matter what anyway, so we can't trust him. Joey? 17.2-ish. 17, okay, about 17 kilograms. We already knew the units were kilograms. We worked that out earlier. That's the only way all these units are going to work. And a fairly complicated problem broken into just a bunch of small problems we could do one at a time. Track the units, track the minus signs, and make a lot fewer mistakes. I don't know, maybe we should ask Chris if he got it right. Do we trust his answer? What'd you get, Chris? Uh, uh, he's just saying that to be nice to me. He knows how much it means to me to be right. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's try another one. I'll leave this one much more to you guys. <clears throat> Oh, let's see, do I want to save that one for a test or not? This one will do. All right, this one will draw by hand. All right, we've got a system starts from rest. this point, we've got a, uh, a box that's going to run along the surface. Um, it's being pulled in that direction by another weight that's hanging there. So we'll call that one A and B bit of originality. Okay, it starts from A. Uh, attached to a spring. So, that's its start position at rest without any of the details put in yet. All right, now some of the details. This distance is 18 inches. The spring constant is 72 pounds per foot. is 12 inches. The uh, box A is 4 pounds. Box B is 8 pounds. Negligible friction, that's pretty nice. Yes, you can't fault me for being nice on some of these things. And what I want you to find find the velocity of the system when x is 4 inches. Let me double check, I got all the pieces. Then when you've got that, find what? 
the maximum X is. Sooner or later, the spring is going to get stretched enough as box A moves away from the anchor that it's going to bring the system back to a stop. Anytime there's gravity, springs, all those other things, the work energy equation works pretty nice. But this is your problem. We'll see how Chris does this time. I'll dump it all into the equation. Start with the work energy equation. See if any parts of it drop out. If they do, you've got a smaller problem right from the start. So this will be point one, and somewhere farther down here we need to, well, the first part is to uh, find out where that is, or what its speed is at that point. Start with the work energy equation and see if any of the parts drop out. If so, you're doing a smaller problem. If two of the parts drop out, you've got a problem half the size already. Look at them one by one. Don't look at the whole system. Don't look at the whole equation. Just look at it one part at a time and see what's going on. Joey. Is the initial velocity zero? Starts from rest, yeah. Starts from rest in that position. Okay. Let go of it there. The weight starts to pull it down. It starts to stretch out the spring. I guess it's possible that it wouldn't move when released if the spring already had enough stretch in it that it wouldn't even let it move. I guess that's possible, but that's not the case here. I, I test all of these in my basement the night before, so I know this one moves. Yeah, it well, that'll be zero in the absence of any non-conservative forces that come from the outside. Pushes, pulls, friction, any of those kind of things are in the work term. Are there any of those non-conservative forces in this problem? speed change? Do we have any height change? Do we have any spring length change? Any of those will cause those terms to go. Any of those could cause uh, terms to go away or stay. Okay, start with the work energy equation. Very easy first step. Just write that down. See if any of them are zero. Just do that right off the top and you've got a smaller problem to work on. If they all drop out, you're done. I guess that, uh, that could be the case if the system didn't move. That's a pretty boring problem. Joe, what do you think? I think so too. We don't have, remember I said the system's frictionless. We don't have any outside pushes, pulls. We don't worry about gravity because that's taken care of in another term. We don't want to count for it twice. And we don't worry about the spring and force it exerts because we also take care of that in another term. So now you can do each one of those individually. Watch your units, watch your plus and minus signs.
my recommendation is do them one little piece at a time. Yeah, see, you do that, it starts getting smaller. And uh, we're looking for that velocity, so that's going to have to remain on that variable. But it's the same for both of them, so that's a little bit easier. What about the mass of the two boxes? Remember what I said a couple weeks ago to do with the mass in the English system? For these kinetic energy terms, we need the mass of each of the boxes, not the weight which is given. Because once you put them back in here, the units are going to correct themselves in the end, and it won't matter what units you have. There's no reason not to stick with those. Why make a move to slugs or pounds, mass, or anything else? So that's about one eighth. What is that? Anybody have that? I don't think I have that written down. Yeah, I don't happen to have that written down. Four divided by 32, two. To four. And the units are pounds second squared per foot. You just leave them like that. Put it in the equation just like that. Since these both have the, oops, I crossed out the wrong one there. Since these both have the same velocity in this case, we can bring a lot of this together. It gets a lot easier. The mass of B is half of that. So we can do uh, put them all together, and the units automatically work out with uh, velocity in feet per second. Point one eight six v two squared. Does that sound right? In foot pounds. We already have feet over here. We haven't used any other term, so we might as well do it in foot pounds. We do have a uh, some distance we're going to move here. We do have a distance there in inches, so you have to be careful with it. Did somebody confirm that? Okay, Tommy, that looks okay. All right, so. There's the masses, uh, and then that's uh, <coughs> that's one half the mass of B. So we don't have to refigure that. Okay, and then do the other two terms. Velocity isn't involved in the gravitational term, so we should be able to figure that one out. Oh, also watch plus and minus signs. This should be positive. B. 
because we're going from rest to some speed. Doesn't matter which way we're going because the speed is always squared. We don't square the velocity. There's no such idea as squaring the velocity. Only block B changes in height. All you have to do is make sure it's in the right units. We're working on foot pounds here, so we might as well stay in foot pounds there. But now is the time to do it. It's very easy to do it when you're working on these little, little sections of the problems. themselves when we needed them. Very easy way to do it. And so we get, uh, should be minus, we got a minus sign on it, 2.66. And we know the units are foot-pounds or pounds-foot, doesn't matter which way you write those. So the last uh, term to work on is the potential energy term. Make sense so far, Tom? See, you almost had the four without the units, didn't you? Okay, do the potential energy term, the spring potential energy. It, it moves four inches. Yeah, but that's inches. And we need it in feet. Okay. That's all. But it's much easier to look at the units in that one little tiny thing than it would be if you dumped everything into the equation. Very easy to lose minus sign, lose it. Units lose. <coughs> Any of the little parts that were put together. All right. So the only thing left to do then is figure out how much the spring is stretched at each of those two places. easy because it's a 12 inch long spring and we had to stretch it six inches just to hook it up. So del one's pretty easy. Del two is not that difficult. You just have to do a 
again, a little Pythagorean theorem on it, four inches down, or four inches over, 18 inches down. L2 is the one you have to figure out. Remember, the length of the spring is not that del term. It's the change in length from rest. So that's 4 inches squared plus 18 inches squared. Square root. That's L2 and the del. Two, you can figure from that by subtracting one foot from it. Remember, we'll need that in feet just to make everything else work out. The spring constant is in pounds per foot, so we'll want the two uh, length terms in feet, respectively. Del one of six inches, but that's half a foot. L two point five three seven feet. That's not right. Yeah. Started in inches, but we got to get it into feet. So now we have those two terms. <laughs> 72 pounds per foot, the spring modulus. Del 2, 0.537 feet squared minus half a foot. Uh, it's going to be positive. Make sense? Notice that the uh, del term is never, since it's always squared, it's never, those are never going to be negative. But the difference between them could be negative. Depends on how we end up. But uh, in terms of del, we don't even care if it's squished or stretched, just as long as it's not as its rest length. And we'll get units on this again of foot pounds or pounds foot uh, to go with everything else. And think that makes sense. Don't drop, lose your units yet, six inches, you need it in feet, so that's what that is. And don't forget to square it, units wouldn't work if we didn't square it. And that term I think comes out to be 1.36. Foot pounds. Does that sound right? Okay. Now we've got all the pieces. You can just put it back in. Back into the work energy equation. Put it back into there. <coughs> Left hand term is zero. Delta T, that's got our unknown in it. We already know the units work, so we're not concerned with those anymore. Um, the minus 266 for the gravitational term and 1.36 
for the elastic energy term, all in foot pounds. And that will give us V2 in feet per second. That's the only way it's going to work out because, uh, because that's what we had here. Feet per second with those units of mass is the only way it's going to work out to give us foot pounds. So we checked all the units, checked all the minus signs. Look at that, and we've got a very easy problem left. Phil, don't you think that reduces down to something awful easy to do? Yep. You like that method? Are, are you going to be one of the disciples? Use that method? Tom, don't you think that's a... I think that's a much easier way to do it. I don't know. Chris likes the big long equations because then he can show them to girls and bars and stuff and say, hey, look at the stuff I can do. I wonder if I leave along. Did it all work out? And so V2 equals 2.64 feet per second. That's the only way the units would have worked out. 2.64 feet per second. Yeah. Okay, we're all we're right about the end, so let's just set up the last part of the problem. Remember, I wanted to find x max. Sooner or later, the spring is going to be stretched out enough that it brings the whole shebang to a stop. So that's a different situation. You need a new start at the work energy equation. So. Somewhere, it goes a little bit farther to x max. So we only have enough time really just to set up that equation. Well, maybe it doesn't change enough. Yeah, I guess it would. <clears throat> Now which of those terms are zero, if any? Any that are zero, we're got, we have a smaller problem. David's got at least one or an answer of none. David? One of delta t will be zero this time, since in order for x to reach its maximum value, t will, the second, <coughs> the but, second velocity will be zero as the <coughs> first. Yeah, x max is when it comes to a stop, because if it didn't come to a stop there, it would go farther, x max would be greater. So that defines x max when the system returns to stationary. It may not stay there, it might oscillate because of the spring, but there is some point when it'll <coughs> meet, you, meet its rightmost travel here at 3 when it comes to a stop. At that time, it's gone from uh, still at the start to still at the finish for our delta t. Remember, we don't care what happens in between. Any other term zero? You got a term, David? The U. Yeah, we still don't have any work. There's still no friction. Uh, I guess we could have done the problem where after four inches we have a, a rougher surface or something, but that's not the case. So. Now we have a problem that's half the size it was when we started and uh, much simpler to look at. Now, don't forget that Vg will be a function of x max and so will Ve. So both of those terms will have our unknown in it and uh, Still, when you put it back together, I think you get a, a relatively simple quadratic that just finishes everything up. And that brings us to the end of the week. I'll give you X math so you can double check it.
when you're looking for something to do over the weekend. I have that goes out to 0.618 feet. And again, that just comes from uh, refiguring those last two turns, both of which will have the unknown in it because you're not sure how far out it goes. Any questions? Watch the units. A lot easier to watch uh, the minus sign and the squares.